Good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us uh, for what promises to be a really topical and interesting talk. Uh, my name's Gail McElroy. I'm Dean of the Faculty of Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences at Trinity, and I'm your chair for this evening. I'm really pleased to welcome you to this IIE webinar, and we're delighted today to be joined by Daniel Treisman, Professor of Political Science at UCLA. Um, the plan of action for this evening is Daniel will talk for 20 to 25 minutes, and then we'll follow up with upwards of 30 minutes of Q&A. So have your questions prepared. Um, you can use the Q&A function on Zoom, um, which you should see on your screen. And you can send in your questions as they arise or at the end, as you see fit. And uh, also, if you would like to join the discussion on X, um, use the handle at IIEA. So now to our speaker of the evening. Uh, Daniel Treisman is a professor of political science at the University of California, Los Angeles. He's also a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. He's a former editor of the American Political Science Review, which is the flagship journal in the discipline of political science. He's consulted for the World Bank, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, and USAID. He's also been a Guggenheim Fellow, an Andrew Carnegie Fellow, and a visiting fellow at the Hoover Institute among many things. Um, his research focuses on Russian politics and economics, as well as comparative political economy. And he's a specialist in the analysis of democratization, the politics of authoritarian states, political decentralization and corruption. And he's going to speak to us this evening about his latest book, which he co-authored with Sergei Guryev, Spin Dictators, The Changing Face of Tyranny in the 21st Century which I'm reliably have been informed has now been translated into 14 languages. And with that, over to you, Daniel, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, I guess I should just get my slides up here. If there's a way to do that, let's see. Okay, here we go. So, Thanks again for inviting me to, to come and talk to you. I'm going to be talking about this book that, uh, as Gail said, I co-authored with Sergei Guryev, a uh, Russian emigre, now economist, and the title is Spin Dictators. And the basic idea here, uh, I seem to be having trouble advancing the slides worked fine a second ago, but let's see. Oh, here we go. So the idea came out of our observations of how authoritarian regimes appear to be changing around the world. So if we think about 20th century dictatorships, the images that quickly come to mind tend to be images of totalitarian leaders like Stalin, Hitler, Mao, whose regimes combined a, a very high level of violent repression and often an imposed official ideology. But even if we think about some of the other 20th century authoritarian leaders, various military regimes in Latin America, uh, Africa and Asia, uh, various other kinds of authoritarian regimes, very many of them were also extremely violent. But if we look at some of the uh, non-democratic, the, the leaders of authoritarian regimes in more recent decades, they look a little bit different. And it seemed to us that they combined, that some of these leaders uh, had helped to develop and, and created a model of authoritarian governance, uh, which combined various things. So here we have Lee Kuan Yew, Alberto Fujimori of Peru, uh, Hugo Chavez, Venezuela, Putin, and I want to emphasize I'll be classifying Putin as a spin dictator in his early phase. We now believe that he has transitioned to a old-fashioned 20th century style uh, fear dictator. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, on the right, Viktor Orban. So what is the type of authoritarian regime that these people operate, what, what is this new model or increasingly prevalent model, which we call spin dictatorship or informational autocracy? Well, these leaders achieve a similar concentration of power. They eliminate checks and balances, but they manage to do so with much less violence or even fear. 
They tend to have no official ideology, although there's often a strong element of anti-Western resentment, some degree of nationalism. They imitate democracy. They hold elections which they claim are genuine. And at least for some periods, uh, they all appear to have had genuine, significant popular support demonstrated in opinion polls, uh, which people tend to believe were relatively reliable. Now, we're not saying that there are no old fashioned 20th century style fear dictators left. Of course, there are some, uh, Bashar al-Assad, uh, Kim Jong-un, uh, obvious examples. We're al also not saying that all 20th century dictators were equally violent. There were some that were not as violent as others. Uh, but we are arguing that the balance has shifted in recent decades. So the central idea of spin dictatorship or informational autocracy, we use those interchangeably, the central idea is that uh, a leader can dominate the political realm and control his society uh, by using deception much more than fear. So instead of scaring people into obedience, the dictator manipulates information to project an image of competent leadership. And we collected various data, uh, original data on things like political prisoners, uh, political killings, uh, alleged use of torture. We combined those with various data about the media, uh, media freedoms and so on, and came up with some measures of different types of regimes. And uh, this is the pattern that, that we found uh, with those data. These are indicators of sp spin dictators and fear dictators. These are the proportions in the cohorts of leaders that came to power in non-democracies in different decades. And we see from the 1970s or 80s, uh, a big fall in the frequency of fear dictators, a big increase in the frequency of spin dictators. Of course, there are also hybrids which combine elements of both. So to go over some of the main distinctions, obviously fear dictators rule through fear. Uh, spin dictators, on the other hand, rule much more through deception. And we show evidence in the book, first of all, that the level of political violence uh, has tended to decrease over time since the 1970s and 1980s. So fewer leaders in authoritarian states uh, in successive decades have ordered large numbers of political killings, have held large numbers of political prisoners, and have been accused of torturing political prisoners. Now, of course, it's a relative shift there are many regimes which continue to hold political prisoners, continue to be accused of torturing political prisoners, but we say, we're, we're arguing that the prevalence has gone down. One thing about fear dictatorships, which is very important, is that they publicize their violence. Uh, the whole idea is to intimidate the population, to scare people into obedience. Spin dictators, when they do use violence, uh, try to conceal con conceal it or deny their responsibility for it. So some examples of that, my favorite example of a fear dictator in, 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 this, uh, in this regard is uh, Muammar Gaddafi of Libya, who made fun of authoritarian leaders who had their political enemies run over by cars or poisoned, who, who used subterfuge of that kind. And he said, according to Amnesty International in 1988, uh, we don't do that. He whom we have executed, we have executed on television, which is kind of a, a motto, it could be a motto, it could be a, 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 char a characteristic uh, statement of the, the credo of fear dictatorship. Uh, we execute people on television. By contrast, uh, spin dictators try to pretend that any violence that happens has nothing to do with them. So Vladimir Putin, as I said, we now feel that he's progressed in the, large, in the last five years to full-fledged, uh, very brutal fear dictatorship. Uh, nevertheless, in his early years, he was an exemplar of this new model of, of spin dictatorship. And even as late as 2015, he could talk about 
uh, the political murder of leading oppositionist Boris Nemtsov in the following way. When, when asked about it, he said, we need to finally rid Russia of disgraces and tragedies like the provocative murder of Boris Nemtsov right in the center of the capital. Of course, he had nothing to do with it, uh, doesn't know anything about it. So how do spin dictators manage with less overt repression? Well, one trick they use is instead of putting people in jail for uh, decades, uh, they put their political opponents in prison for short periods and repeated short periods. Uh, and this, this way, it's less obvious to human rights observers. Uh, they can claim that it's just a temporary detention uh, for uh, violation of some administrative regulation or so on. For instance, Ilya Yashin, uh, Democratic opposition leader in Russia. Now Putin has put him in jail for a long uh, prison term. But earlier, uh, the authorities would arrest him for two, three weeks at a time, and they would do this repeatedly. Usually before an opposition rally was planned, uh, the opposition leaders would be rounded up and put in temporary detention. So this kind of uh, revolving door imprisonment is a characteristic strategy of spin dictatorships. Another, th another one is to pretend that they're arresting a political opponent for non-political offenses. This Kurdish politician, Nuritin Demirtas, was arrested for supposedly using a fake health certificate to avoid military service, an excellent crime to pin on your opponent because it suggests uh, not only is he dishonest, but he's also a coward. So how, how do uh, authoritarian regimes, spin dictatorships, uh, man manage to always win elections? Well, rather than banning opposition candidates and parties outright, which is what old style authoritarian governments that used to hold elections used to do. They used to have uh, single party elections or uh, uh, token parties, but with one very dominant party. The mode of operation for spin dictatorships is much less often to ban parties outright, but instead to harass opposition candidates and to impose media bias, to manipulate the media uh, so that they are treated very unfavorably. And that was data from uh, the NELDA database on these aspects of election manipulation. So other differences, well, unlike many fear dictators, spin dictators uh, tend to have no official ideology, no imposed ideology. Uh, they try to project an image of competence uh, rather than to intimidate. So it's uh, they use a rhetoric emphasizing their ability to manage the economy effectively uh, or manage the to administer professionally uh, rather than trying to scare citizens. And uh, we did a simple exercise analyzing speeches that different types of leaders had given. We selected a, a bunch of, of major leaders from, from uh, the 20th century and recent decades. And the main point here is that the spin dictators who are in green, we're classifying them here in terms of how many words in their speeches that we, we analyzed uh, were related to violence and how many words were related to economic performance and public services. So very simple text analysis. Uh, but as you see, the fear dictators in red uh, tended to have relatively high uh, proportions of words related to violence. Uh, the Democrats in blue tended to have lower rhetoric of violence and more words connected to economic performance and public services. And the spin dictators who are in green uh, tend to blend in with the Democrats rather than with the fear dictators. Okay, so if we're right that there's been this change in the prevalence of different types of dictatorships, why is it happening? Well, we argue that the rise of spin dictatorship is associated uh, with both modernization and globalization. Now, of course, in political science, there's this theory called modernization theory, which says as countries develop economically, that makes it more likely that they'll transition to democracy. 
We mostly agree with that, but we add a, a couple of additional points. First of all, we think that it's not just a matter of modernization within a given country. Uh, modernization worldwide also has effects. So as more and more countries modernize around the world, as more and more countries develop economically, uh, this leads to generates uh, NGOs on a global scale and media on a global scale, which then can trigger transitions, even in countries that themselves are not so economically developed. So there's both a within countries modernization dynamic, and there's also a worldwide global modernization dynamic. That's the first point. And the second point is, yes, in the long run, economic development puts more and more pressure on dictator, on authoritarian regimes to transition to democracy, but uh, dictators can deflect these pressures, at least for a while, by adopting the techniques of spin dictatorship. So we see this as a reaction to the pressures that come with economic development. Uh, it's very hard to run a knowledge economy uh, with intimidation and fear, uh, but if you can substitute for the fear, manipulation and deception, uh, then that's more compatible and with, with a modern style knowledge economy. And so that can work for a while. If we're right about this, I'm running through very quickly things that we devote more attention to, obviously, in the book. If we're right about this, what does the future hold? Well, if modernization and globalization continue, uh, we should expect to, this to lead to more and more pressure on spin dictators to democratize, but also on authoritarian governments to shift from fear to spin. On the other hand, if modernization stalls and globalization reverses, some people already see signs of this, then those pressures are going to be weaker. Uh, and we shouldn't necessarily see as rapid a decline in violent dictatorship. Now, what happens when spin fails, and that can be because society becomes too modern, uh, even for these techniques to work, or it could be because of economic crisis or some other pressures on the, on the regime, when, when spin dictators, for whatever reasons, come to fear that their model of sophisticated deception and manipulation is no longer working, then sometimes they revert to fear, uh, to the old strategies of intimidation. And we've seen this in several recent cases. So in Venezuela, the transition from Chavez, spin dictator, to Maduro, fear dictator. In Turkey, we've seen Erdogan progress uh, from spin to something much closer to fear. And of course, as I mentioned, in Russia, uh, Putin in the last five years or so has moved uh, away from mostly deception to a model of mostly intimidation. So it's hard to use the techniques of old fashioned fear dictatorship without destroying the economy uh, if it's a modern knowledge-based internationally connected economy, but it can work for a while as we see in various cases. How should Western democracies uh, respond? Well, in the book, we argue for something we call adversarial engagement. It's not possible to simply decouple, for, for the Western democracies to decouple from the authoritarian world. Interconnections are just too great for that, and it wouldn't be productive uh, to try and decouple. But there are various things that uh, we argue the West needs to do more effectively than in the past. First of all, that we need to monitor better these interactions with authoritarian countries, both spin dictatorships and actually fear dictatorships. We need to imp improve counterintelligence, cybersecurity, financial monitoring. We need to reform our own democracies uh, to create a more uh, attractive alternative image of how society can be organized uh, to compete in this global competition for political models. And we need to stop enabling dictators around the world, whether spin or fear dictators. There's a whole infrastructure in 
many Western societies designed to service and enable foreign dictators, from lobbyists to lawyers to bankers to tech companies who are all providing services uh, for these regimes that are oppressing their own people and often trying to influence and uh, corrupt our own political regimes. We need to defend and reform international institutions, which are often manipulated from inside by spin dictatorships and also to some extent, fear dictatorships. I'm thinking of institutions like Interpol, which Russia has, and many other authoritarian countries, have tried to use to pursue their opponents worldwide. Uh, the UN, NATO, EU, which is, has been held to ransom by Viktor Orban and, uh, and some others. And finally, we need to support democracy democratically. So we shouldn't give up on supporting democracy around the world, but using military force is not effective. It's clearly in many cases counterproductive. So we need to appeal to public opinion, to forge coalitions, to build on areas of agreement. And I think we need to be more modest than some American administrations have been in the past, but also more consistent. So finally, just to wrap up what is obviously a very quick uh, presentation of of some of the ideas in the book. We're making the argument that something has really changed since the 1970s, that spin dictatorship has been spreading, overtaking uh, the model of authoritarian governance based on fear. Key ideas that in place of mass terror and ideological brainwashing, we see information manipulation to boost popularity. Uh, part of this is the creation of fake democracy, uh, imitating democracy, but always managing somehow to win the elections uh, that one presents to the public. It, can, it, it, it involves projecting an image of competence and effectiveness and rhetorically uh, spin dictators sound rather different from fear dictators. This model seems to us better adapted to life in a world with open borders, economic interdependence, global media, and highly educated populations. That's why we think that it's become more prevalent because it's just more consistent with those aspects of a modern globalized world. Uh, eventually those same trends of economic development, of social modernization, uh, make spin harder to operate. In fact, the only country that has managed to maintain spin dictatorship, even as the country became highly modern, is Singapore, uh, which is really an example to many of these other authoritarian leaders. Uh, it's, it's striking how many of them looked up to Lee Kuan Yew, uh, Putin and Nazarbayev in Kazakhstan both gave him medals. They've copied some of his innovations in, in small ways. Uh, but no other country has managed to become as anywhere near as rich and uh, economically developed as, as Singapore while maintaining this model of spin dictatorship. So uh, when crisis arises, what tends to happen is either a transition to democracy or a reversion uh, to old style repression, as we see in Russia and Venezuela, <clears throat> excuse me, but that has real economic costs. And uh, although it can work definitely for a while, uh, those economic costs ultimately we think uh, cannot, are, are not consistent with, with stability in the economy and social order uh, indefinitely. So I'll end there and look forward to your, your questions and comments. Thank you.